I'm here with Tom Gallagher, who uh, has recently released his latest book, which is called Europe's Leadership Famine, which is available now on Amazon, uh, subtitled Portraits of Defiance and Decay, 1950 to 2022. Um, Tom, thanks for coming on the show. Great to be here, Mark. Well, it's good to have you as well. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the books that you've written before this one. Well, I've been writing and teaching uh, for, I think, at least 40 years. Uh, I'm one of many uh, Scots who pursued a professional career uh, in England and felt fulfilled by uh, that experience. I taught uh, a mixture of history and uh, politics at the University of Bradford for almost a third of a century, specialising in ethnic conflicts in Europe, their roots how to manage them. Uh, And from uh, about 2012, I've been um, a a, private scholar and uh, commentator. Right. Okay. So um, what what, what kind of inspired you to write this book here about the leadership famine? Well, I I think the dominance of the European Union has killed a, a, a lot of genuine historical inquiry on Uh, Europe, what's happened over the last 50 years, where it's going. I mean, much of the the work that's been published has been formulaic, emphasis on ideology, on processes, uh, on on plans and long-term agendas. Uh, I I don't think by any means that the human dimension explains, accounts for the motor of history, but it it has been neglected. you know, for because of the dominance of public relations in the political process, there is a great reluctance to probe the conduct, the record, the motivation of leading politicians unless they, you know, make complete asses of themselves or are found to have behaved very badly. And then it's open season. So, uh, you know, a lot of important figures whose decisions have influenced the arc of history, uh, on, you know, only emerge uh, in their true dimensions long after they've vacated the scene. So I thought it, it was perhaps worthwhile to shine a probing light on people who have, who are still in power or, or who have been important contemporary figures up to quite recently. Yeah, in the book here, just reading the cover here, we have uh, Macron, Schroeder, Andriotti, Tito, Spack, Giscard, Sang, Merkel, Papandreou, Pujol, Johnson, Sanchez, Orban, Mitterrand, Ju- Ju- I can't even say that, Ju- Ju- <laughs> Jukanovic. Jukanovic, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Rutte, Rutt, um, Berlusconi, Sturgeon, Kekkonen, Schultz and Zelensky. So covering quite a lot of uh, different people in different time periods from the Cold War right up through to today. Do you feel that there's been a change in the quality of leadership as uh, time has progressed? Yes, uh, I think up until perhaps the end of the Cold War, uh, leaders were more in touch with their populations they were less uh, prone to hubris, to uh, go over the top, to you know think I'm invisible, invincible, and I, I can do no wrong. They tended to, uh, to develop their experiences and their qualifications for leadership in a variety of different roles as entrepreneurs, as community people, as soldiers, uh, as social uh, social activists. Uh, uh, but uh, and, and and I think this uh, wide experience helped them to cope with unexpected occurrences, crises, uh, 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 challenges, deep-seated problems in the countries they ruled over. But because the stage is narrowed, and because politicians are being drawn from a, a, a very restricted sector of the population, and their experiences before assuming high office, tend to be very limited. You increasingly have politicians who are, I would say anyway, not cut out for the challenges that they often face uh, when in office, uh, a leadership deficit, in other words, and people spot this. uh, And, uh, you know, they grow increasingly uh, disillusioned and contemptuous. Uh, of of politicians who reign over them. 
But uh, you say that in the introduction that this isn't actually a biography of uh, different leaders. How does it, how how is your approach different from say uh, from other writers who are talking about leadership? Well, I, I look at how a cross section of politicians who fitted into uh, a, a, you know a, a number of key areas or themes, uh, you know, coped with important responsibilities and challenges. Uh, and uh, it's clear that uh, the further you move away from the, the post immediate post-war period, the, the less success politicians had, uh, you know, with uh, uh, coping with and responding effectively to uh, problems and crises that, that um, arose. So I ask, uh, I, you know, there's plenty of analysis on why politicians were uh, falling down in the job, were increasingly uh, unfocused uh, uh, and listless uh, uh, in, uh, you know, dealing with everyday and sometimes exceptional uh, uh, problems. Uh, and I come to the conclusion that there, you know, is, is basically a major vacuum in politics in Europe uh, it's not confined to any part of the political spectrum, uh, 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 and it doesn't affect some countries with different stages of socio-economic development. It, uh, you know, it it's really is deep rooted, uh, uh, and uh, it seems to be getting worse. I mean, you uh, you say that leaders have not been able to keep up with change. But you think that is a problem of the leaders themselves or the system that elevates them, or is the world just simply more complex now? Well, uh, you know, the, the the world, of course, is more complex, but I, I think uh, countries have uh, more tools for uh, dealing, uh, you know, with many of these challenges. On the positive side, if you look at uh, the, the, the third world, um, you know, Tens, hundreds of millions of people have been drawn out of uh, poverty because of, uh, you know, the developmental tools that now exist. Europe should be thriving. Uh, you know, it has so many things going uh, in uh, it, it, its uh, its favour, but it, it, instead it, it has been drifting. Uh, you know, there has been a huge and growing cleavage between. Uh, the population and uh, the elite uh, elite class. Um, you know, it's wrong to to blame uh, particular in, in individuals. Uh, some individuals, I think, did cause a lot of harm. Mitterrand in France in the 1980s brought in a lot of bad habits. Schroeder and Merkel, uh, who succeeded each other as German chancellors, uh, 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 similarly, but politicians are basically creatures of the environment in which they have uh, grown up, and the you know the environment is making it increasingly hard for people with talent, with vision, with strategies for um, you know improving things or at least preventing problems uh, worsening. These people aren't coming forward; they're being dissuaded from. Uh, entering public life, and uh, incre increasingly, wherever you look, it's second-rate uh, pedestrian uh, uh, people, people who sometimes are, are quite sinister or malevolent or merely just uh, mediocre and unfocused, who, who take the helm and are capable of uh, doing a lot of damage. How would you define a good leader then? Well, uh, I think Machiavelli de defined uh, uh, leadership uh, quite well. He was writing uh, 600 years ago, and you know, I, I, I think his handbook ha has stood the test of time. The thing that stands out in the democratic era is, is that uh, effective leadership involves uh, winning and retaining the trust of the people. Uh, 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 and even in an age of tyranny and despotism, um, the Italian philosopher saw this uh, uh, as a, a key requirement. But 
looking in the early 21st century, I, 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 I don't see uh, the need to engage with the people, build bridges, uh, communicate, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, display assurance as priorities anymore. I mean, uh, in increasingly, the emphasis is on blindsiding uh, the electorate, uh, you know, trying to uh, use a box of tricks to persuade, the, you know, to try to, so that they can s not really see what you are up to. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, this kind of uh, decept politics of deception, of masquerade, uh, you know, especially in the run up to elections, it's clear, you know, there hasn't been a major politician for many years who has enjoyed fighting elections. And some of the politicians in the early period did, you know, they were, they relished the cut and thrust. Uh, or, 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 you know, and going before the people, displaying their uh, attributes, uh, you know, showing what they could offer. It was a kind of gladiatorial co uh, contest. You know, there are a few political gladi gladiators now who really relish entering the electoral arena. Elections are uh, a, you know, a, a burden uh, to shake off as quickly as possible. One big explanation for this, not the only one, is uh, the rise of the European Union, uh, we, uh, we, whose office holders are not elected. They don't uh, acquire require legitimacy through the electoral process. The European Parliament uh, has very few powers. It certainly doesn't pass laws. Uh, and, uh, so, and so as the EU's powers have expanded, it increasingly sees national elections as threats to its domination. Yes. Uh, well, we saw that in Italy, I think, and also maybe in Greece as well, where they tried to influence the national um, elections and said that if you don't vote a certain way, then then we won't you'll withdraw powers or we'll do certain things uh, to punish uh, the pop populace. It's almost as if the populace uh, the voters are an afterthought in some way, and one of the things and, you yeah. also one of the old things you also brought up was the rise of these kind of maybe uh, you know, global global agendas, perhaps uh, or transnational agendas such as uh, climate uh, 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 policy and globalization, all these things that are things that politicians like to talk about when they go f they have meetups you know, at Davos and wherever, but uh, the population seems very disconnected from, and I think certainly we've been to see it perhaps some of this in the in the pushback against these net zero policies, just as an example. Well, I think a club atmosphere has grown up uh, among politicians, certainly in the uh, key uh, European Atlantic countries, North American countries, uh, and uh, you know they they are keen to try out uh, very sort of experimental uh, ideas that you know are capable of profoundly reshaping our human existence that haven't properly been uh, uh, road tested and which have been promoted by. Uh, lobbies, by uh, campaigning groups, by international bureaucracies, and of course by corporate big business, by very uh, important uh, 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 moguls who uh, you know who have a sort of power complex who wish to leave a profound legacy uh, on on the world, and politicians all too easily have been uh, dragged into this kind of. Um, restricted, uh, you know, club, uh, uh, and you know, the, I'm sure when they gather at World Trade Organization events and NATO events at European uh, 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 summits at transatlantic summits, the last thing on their minds of most of them is how will this play with the folks back home? Right. I mean, the folks back home are basically to to be managed and to be told what they have to swallow. And, you know, that, that, that's, that's a really new 
and disturbing phenomenon that wasn't visible in democratic countries during the Cold War. Uh, uh, I mean, during the Cold War, politicians uh, in the West felt that they had to behave with a certain degree of restraint and decorum towards the populations, not show arrogance uh, and dismissiveness in case there was a backlash. Yes. Uh, but that, that, uh, that kind of humility has vanished when you just see the, uh, you know, the, the way that someone like Macron uh, behaves and other leaders too. So, yeah, I think this is a quite important point that the, 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 there's a, such a disconnect. I mean, I talk to lots of people at the moment. They say, no one represents me. These parties are all doing their own thing. And even people who, let's say they're core conservatives, maybe even core Labour people, they're like, that. this is not, yeah, I have to vote for them, but it's not really what I want. And there's a disconnect maybe coming from the top down as well and, and from the bottom up. And at a certain point, that does leave... Um, a space, I think, for demagogues and people, autocrats, to come in. Perhaps you think that's possible. Yes, I I, I refer to that in, in in the book. I mean, you could say that one of these characters has broken through. That's Viktor Orban in Hungary, and an, another one, uh, slightly less confrontational, uh, the Italian prime minister since last year, uh, Giorgio Meloni, uh, is is making. Uh, Making very, very, very good headway. So, uh, so I thought I refer to Maloney, uh, who appeared just as the book was being completed in a uh, in a number of places. I think she will be an important figure, uh, and if she is able to um, connect effectively with the Italian population and deliver the promises after. 30 years of economic decline and unhappiness in Italy, then this could be a, 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 an important sign that he, you know, here is a top-ranked politician who isn't afraid of people, who wants a reputation to be based on making their lives better. But there are so few other people like that. So one of the people you talk about in your book, uh, of course, is Nicola Sturgeon and her brand of nationalism. In fact, it's part of a section called Entrepreneurs of Ethnicity. What did you mean by that? Well, uh, one of the key phenomena in, in politics that uh, is, has been visible uh, as the century has advanced is, is the importance of the psychological dimension for a lot of people, especially young middle class people who materially, uh, not in all cases, are quite un- quite fulfilled and they are, you know, they, they are looking for uh, self-realization, not through economic security, not through uh, establishing a family, conventional rites of passage, but by identifying with the world, by identifying with various niche causes. Uh, territorial uh, issues, uh, and so you know a lot of uh, savvy uh, politicians have noticed that there is a market here to be exploited. The frustrations uh, of young restless people who uh, you know are no longer willing to fit into the roles that previous generations had done. So. Um, so green separatist, one world uh, movements, other niche movements have have emerged, you know, to demand you know a new order, a new uh, 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 beginning, uh, and I think Sturgeon uh, has uh, has been possibly uh, you know the, the the most high profile of. Of, of of these uh, uh, pol- politicians, uh, she certainly had you know various qu- qualities to to assume the role of a sort of you know a crusader for uh, a, a better world. Uh, she's a, a very energetic, very driven uh, person. She's fluent, uh, and above all, she has the ability to control. Uh, and uh, to uh, to dominate, uh, 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 and so 
in, in terms of Europe, a very unusual type of, of figure. I mean, uh, I think politics uh, in Britain and in Europe has put barriers against a domineering figure acquiring the amount of power that Sturgeon did. There are strong uh, parties, parliaments, civil societies, legal systems uh, that means uh, a, a figure cannot make up her own rules, as many believe Sturgeon mm. uh, 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 did. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, I think it was Lenin who said, uh, when I push and I meet steel, I withdraw. When I push and all I encounter is mush, I a- advance. Mm. And I think Sturgeon... Uh, um, she, you know, she realised that there was a kind of power vacuum uh, that she could uh, fill, uh, owing to the lacks of checks and balances in the de- devolution uh, settlement and the willingness of London, uh, which in theory, according to the 1998 uh, act setting up the Scottish Parliament, you know, has power over this subordinate unit. London just abdicated, yes. and it was so. It was only when Rishi Sunak uh, vetoed Sturgeon's gender recognition bill uh, earlier this year that it, you know she was stopped in her tracks. I mean, you say it's quite interesting. I thought one of the points was, and, I, and perhaps maybe I'm a bit daft for not really noticing it before, but of course, nationalism is a uh, is an identity politics and but st- there's all these other identity politics as well that Sturgeon was um, you maybe you was pushing as well the gender recognition um, is being the most famous one mm. of course um, so it's all part of the same thing to you the same kind of nationalism um, gender politics it's all this kind of uh, 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 pushing identity, as a way to distract from other issues? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the search for new forms of identity in order to validate your existence uh, um, ha- has speeded up, uh, you know, b- because society has be- become far more complex. A lot of the old kind of structures uh, ha- ha- have, have broken down. So, you know, there there are all sorts of opportunities for entrepreneurs, for, uh, you know, political hucksters, wheeler dealers to come forward and say, well, you know, rally, march behind me and I, I, you know, I will make what you believe in possible through laws, etc. And the, the great paradox with Sturgeon is that, you know, she made her way uh, until midlife uh, as a, a fairly bog-standard, orthodox, territorially-minded politician who wanted to set up a new state uh, in uh, in Europe, break away from an existing one. But once she really tasted power, uh, you know, her, her, her sort of core task faded into the background and she picked up a, a lot of other issues that uh, suggest suggest to me and suggest to a lot of her former uh, colleagues who feel betrayed by uh, what she did or didn't do while in office that instead of being a sort of nationalist, she was really a, a, a some kind of in, a, an internationalist, you know, who, who was who was world focused. First example of that was Brexit. Uh, uh, um, she, she had lots of opportunities, r- really, to uh, make life impossible for uh, a, a very badly divided London establishment, uh, and, and instead she just r- rallied round in a rather mulish, uh, poorly worked out way, uh, one faction in in the conflict over whether there should be a, a Brexit or. Or, or, or not, and moved, you know, failed to use the sort of, uh, you know, Brexit fracture in British political life to advance the cause of Scottish independence. And it went on uh, uh, from there. 
she embraced the Me Too movement, the, the idea yes. that women uh, shouldn't no longer be the playthings of dominant uh, and unscrupulous men. Uh, uh, and uh, it would seem really to uh, have a go with or perhaps even destroy her predecessor, the man who had put her in the position she found herself, Alex Hammond. Uh, and um, and then it was the green, the, the environmental issue. Uh, uh, I mean, she, fought, throughout her political career, evangelised about the importance of the hydrocarbon resource in the North Sea that was really Scotland's oil. Uh, and uh, But suddenly by 2020, because the international mood was changing against industry, uh, uh, she decided she, she, she must jump on this bandwagon and become a, a, a militant opposing uh, the car economy, op- opposing any further extraction of oil from uh, f- from from the North Sea, and I, you know, she got away with these dizzy somersaults. Uh, I think for a, a very sad uh, uh, reason, and she was operating in an, a very underdeveloped political system where uh, there were few. Uh, uh, ch- checks and balances, where I would say that it was all too easy for her, who you know was a skilled manipulator of the media, uh, uh, to infantilize uh, a large section uh, of 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 the population. It's a kind of Pied Piper, able to rally particularly young middle class Scots who had gone to university, who were. Uh, enthused by uh, you know the ecological themes mm-hmm. uh, you know around around her cause, but it was a small segment of the population. She basically lost far more adherence than she gained. Well, certainly with the gender recognition reform, she went into increasingly narrow uh, policy areas that the majority of Scots and UK citizens, whatever, uh, didn't support at all, and that ultimately brought her downfall. Um, do you think that it was inevitable that that would happen? Um, not really. Uh, uh, you know, I, th- I think uh, we, s- we still don't know you know, what the last days of Sturgeon were all about. There's mm-hmm. still uh, a lot to come out. After Jacinda Ardern said, I've left nothing left in my tank, she was asked about this. I've plenty left yes, in my tank. Right. But weeks later, she was gone. Something happened uh, uh, during those times. There is uh, there is m- much speculation, and we have police investigations uh, uh, that have led to both the arrest of her and her, and her husband, um, that uh, suggest that she had a proprietorial role to the state. She, you know, she she, she basically thought, as in the French uh, expression of Louis the Fourteenth, "L'État c'est moi, I am the state." Yes, uh, and so she could uh, impose and dispose. Uh, 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 as she saw fit, perhaps convincing herself that it, she was doing good uh, all, 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 all the while. So that you know, this this was uh, a remarkably uh, driven uh, um, figure, uh, but and I I can't see outside conditions of war, invasion, uh, um, upheaval. A similar politician in uh, democratic Europe enjoying such a long run as she did. And I think it it, it beams a very unforgiving light on uh, the maturity of Scotland, Uh, you know, the the democratic calibre of the country, which I think... is alarmingly superficial. Is that to do with the systems 
that are in place, uh, the devolution settlement and failures in that, or to do with the way that the Scottish populace has developed. For example, you know, you and I think maybe in one of your earlier books, you talked a lot about religion and rise, how um, uh, politics maybe replaces religion. Is that is that the feeling now that maybe politics is treated as some type of religion or very tribal in Scotland, or is it to do with the structures? I, th- I think the sort of re- religious fault line uh, ha- has decreased as Scotland has become a a, a, a post Christian country. Uh, I mean, there there is a uh, tribal cleavage in Scotland, which was shown during. Uh, the period, long period of the referendum campaign in 2014, uh, which split social life uh, very, uh, very badly. And it's only when unionists and nationalists came together recently to oppose, you know, her gender recognition plans that there was some healing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, vis- visible. So a, a, a big slice of the electorate has been con- has been satisfied with identity politics, with tribalism from the top, and they're not too bothered if there isn't uh, uh, delivery of policies, uh, and even if there is a collapse uh, in things like ferries, uh, the condition uh, of urban infrastructure, uh, uh, etc. You know, if uh, a leader can provide this segment of the population. We're pro- talking perhaps of up to twenty percent, twenty-five percent, with non-stop demagoguery. Then people were prepared to live with that and to, uh, you know, screen out the downsides, uh, unacceptable conduct uh, associated with Sturgeon's rule. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you think that Sturgeon will be remembered? Um, well, it really depends whether Scotland has a takes a good hard look at itself, cleans itself up, uh, uh, gets rid of a, a, a lot of the sleaze, uh, you know, a lot of the parasites uh, who, uh, in the public serv- sector, uh, civil service, um, charities, local government. Who, who have really done well thanks to being footstools mm-hmm. for uh, uh, Sturgeon and who, you know, who have, have allowed uh, Scotland to decay, uh, you know, to, to become one of the you know, most underdeveloped uh, uh, places in the United Kingdom. Uh, so if, if, if there is a kind of turning point, uh, if better quality people... Uh, reform uh, the, the political system, make Parliament more uh, uh, important, reduce the anomaly whereby the First Minister can have very important say over, it would seem, uh, the, the legal process, uh, just, you know, cases, etc. Uh, if there is proper devolution to uh, the local level, uh, and if uh, people with talent and uh, idealism rather than s- cynicism and just an ability and a desire to make a lot of money out of politics, if the better sort get into politics, then I think Sturgeon, uh, sorry to say this, will be seen as a bit of a freak. Uh, but yeah. uh, if similar people uh, take over, not just from the SNP, uh, but from Labour and whoever else, and they sail close to the wind uh, and uh, they abuse the system for their own particular uh, ends, then Sturgeon will just be seen as part of, uh, you know, of a very sad decay of Scotland, perhaps not, never seen since the 17th century, a century of persistent uh, violence and power struggles. So, um, so I, I think there, there, there needs to be uh, a, a, a realisation that uh, Sturgeon took this country to a bad place and if there's just tinkering around the edges, there's a real chance that somebody similar, somebody perhaps even smarter 
more seductive because she wasn't seductive. She was uh, quite an intimidating, abrasive mm. yes. figure. She put a lot of people's backs up. Uh, but, you know, you could have somebody who had the same, uh, you know, totalitarian uh, end as Sturgeon, who, who is a far more seductive, smooth-tongued, yes. uh, uh, appealing figure. Uh, and that you know that that who would always say I'm nothing like Nicholas Sturgeon, but in, pra- in practice underneath, just as bad if not worse. There are such people, uh, uh, probably preparing uh, to so, ha- uh, have 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 their uh, chance. In as the you say, well, entre- they're entrepreneurs, but political okay. entrepreneurs, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they're saying, what is this marketplace like? We have a marketplace in Scotland politically perhaps naive or undeveloped. We have institutions that are also um, poorly developed and don't have proper checks and balances. So that that system will attract people who are like that. We often say that, actually, that um, you know nationalism is a way for a, a weak, a cynical, uh, incompetent politicians to hide there, hide all that, and just prom- make by delivering promises. But perhaps we can the, the same can apply to whether whatever whatever promise their uh, identity promise they are they are putting out. So, but yes, perhaps it's quite possible um, that it might not be under the guise of nationalism, but under something else. Yeah, that's right. I think you you have to have a a, a political culture that. Uh, is is less based on the politics of resentment on victimhood, and I think Labour can express that uh, uh, too, uh, and that, that that wants to be more people orientated, wants to make a difference to the face of the country, to the condition uh, of, of of the people. You know, genuine uh, ambitions rather than just. Uh, yes, really but well, nice that, I think that sounds like quite hard work for m- m- many politicians might say that and just say, go for the easy option. And also maybe the populace as well is a little bit easily seduced. It's a two-way street to some extent. I think there does need to be some education and perhaps this thing with Sturgeon's um, decline, uh, fall from power, fall from grace is, is you know, a cautionary tale and will would will Scots be able to take that on? I mean, certainly we're still seeing the Scottish Labour Party still trying to fight uh, the gender re- recognition thing that they weren't actually even for. Um, and after seeing Nicola Sturgeon getting totally beaten down by that and having to lose her position, so it still seems to be reverberations are there, but um, maybe lessons aren't being learned. Yeah, I mean, uh, Scottish politics are very parochial. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the Scottish government has spent huge amounts of money which have been denied to, uh, you know, trying to end the drug ac- epidemic and other uh, urgent causes to promote the, uh, the country on the kind of wider European uh, and, and world stage. But, this, you know, it, it's, it's basically just a, a con, uh, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's it's just public relations free travel service for the, the elite folk who are uh, uh, in power. It, it really, I think, is necessary for uh, far more Scots to realise that uh, you know, for the last ten, fifteen years, the country has been in a very bad place. It's humiliated itself. It has uh, acquired some of the so far non-violent features which disfigured parts of post-communist Eastern Europe after the uh, the Cold War. People are talking about the austerisation of Scottish politics, you know, del- de- deliberately uh, uh, copying this, uh, the Northern Irish tribal uh, um, formula for uh, electoral ends. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that you know this is uh, really deplorable. Uh, and if you had a better quality media, if if you had a less propagandic uh, teaching of history uh, uh, in schools, then I, I think uh, opportunists in power would be less able to get away with it.
Well, I think, yes, yeah, certainly the media has a lot to answer for in the case of Sturgeon. I mean, basically we're using her um, through the COVID pandemic, through Brexit, as well as a way to beat up the conservative leadership at that time, rather than looking at uh, Sturgeon's actual home faults. And the same thing has been happening recently. You know, you see them, uh, London-based media bringing on Alex Salmon now as, as some kind of elder statesman to, again, to talk about uh, issues with the UK government instead of actually looking at his policies, which are bunk, actually. And, they say, and if you actually went into that, they would be like, they would be horrified. Um, but they don't, that's not the way they do that. So the media, I felt certainly, has been complicit in Sturgeon's rise Um and not so much in her fall, but more, certainly in in giving her power and enabling her, and perhaps that's one of your things. It's a um, appeals to middle class, younger middle class people. Um, that type of uh, building building the personality up as some kind of savior. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I think the media used to pride itself on speaking truth to power, uh, and. Uh, you know, holding uh, democratic rulers uh, to uh, to account, but as uh, you know, the structure of the media has changed. Uh, as it's far more difficult uh, for newspapers or television platforms to make money, th- they have doubled down and ha- you know d- increasingly depend on niche groups mm-hmm. uh, rather than a broad sector of the population. Uh, for their revenue. Uh, And uh, one of the niche groups which has benefited has been Scottish separatism. I mean, during the COVID pandemic, um, the government put huge amounts of uh, revenue the way of uh, cash-strapped newspapers uh, and uh, uh, television stations. Uh, And uh, these... Uh, media outlets responded in kind by mm-hmm. being very indulgent, very uh, myopic uh, when, uh, you know, the poor quality uh, management of uh, the pandemic on Sturgeon's watch became uh, all too obvious, but it was it was never properly uh, looked into. There were no debates, mm-hmm. uh, you know, involving... Uh, people who, you know, experts uh, um, who had been frozen out. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of the epidemiologist Hugh Pennington, yes. world-renowned figure, uh, who, you know, and said she was quite happy to uh, use as her chief sort of mouthpiece on the COVID thing an airhead like, uh, I can't remember her second name, the Sridi, uh, she, she, you know, person from Edinburgh University who had no medical qualifications uh, 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 whatsoever. The media should have made a field day. uh, uh, You know, there were so many opportunities for red-hot stories to be uh, produced, but instead they were sock sock puppets, uh, you know, for uh, her her administration. Well, one of the, the things that you, I think is in your book as well, as you mentioned, is the capture of civil society, including, I suppose, the media as well. And that has been a success, well, if you put that in inverted commas, a success of Nicola Sturgeon's reign, um, that it has been so captured. Do you think we can ext- Scotland can extricate itself from that? Well, I, th- I, I think that the danger is that it won't, uh, that, uh, you know, Labour... Uh, if if it is going to supplant uh, the SNP electorally next year, uh, uh, we'll say you know we are a new broom, uh, you know, uh, 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 and different order starts with us. But I think they will use the same kind of uh, stick and carrot approach to uh, obtain uh, backing in all seasons from uh, you know the huge archipelago of groups that make up Mm -hmm. uh, 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 charities, advisory bodies, quangos, uh, uh, etc. You know, I, I, and, uh, you know, so, you know, instead of reaching out to 
uh, the populace, building bridges. Uh, the danger is that a, a non-SNP government uh, um, uh, in the future will uh, will sim- simply emulate the, manip- the manipulative role that she uh, uh, had in order to make civil society a captive. Okay, going to finish up with a couple of questions. Going back to Europe, um, a recent chart showed that the EU has had half the growth of the United States. I don't know if you saw that over the past decade or whatever it was, 20 years. Um, what do you think? Do you think that is a leadership issue? Well, uh, I think the priorities of of the EU ha- 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 have been wrong. Uh, no new major economic uh, firms have emerged from Europe uh, for a long, long time. And, the, the, you know, the major brand names, uh, mainly, I think, from Germany uh, in the engineering and the car making uh, role uh, um, field, uh, you know, they have suffered uh, possibly terminal uh, uh, reverses because, you know, they have they have been uh, so low grade in responding to the challenges of new technology from East Asia and from uh, uh, and, and, and from nor- North America. I mean, the EU has moved from being uh, an organisation encouraging uh, trade to, you know, increasingly being one that shapes the whole European political uh, uh, economy. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's very kind of unimaginative, plodding, uh, so many vested interests, uh, prevent uh, any clear-sighted awareness of what are the challenges to prevent Europe uh, falling into a peripheral role uh, in, in in the world economy. Uh, and I think rest of populations see the mediocrity, see the opportunism that, you know, the politicians and favoured uh, you know, top uh, economists are dividing up the pie for short-term reasons, not leaving any seed corn uh, to make uh, Europe count in the world economically uh, in, uh, in, in, in the future. So I think this powerfully re- reinforces the disconnect between the elite uh, and uh, and, and society, which I don't think existed in earlier phases of the democratic story in Europe, when there was plenty of class conflict, but nevertheless there was a there was a thanks to the importance of family, religion, different socialising experiences, people could relate to one another despite their differences. Now there's a yawning chasm between those who uh, are privileged. You know, we've had the lucky breaks and the great majority uh, who are struggling, who feel that uh, politicians are only there to do bad things to them, to experiment with them, to snatch away things like motor cars, like their Mm -hmm. uh, farm animals uh, that uh, they took for granted. Uh, So so I think think there needs to be some kind of reformation Otherwise, uh, you know, just peering into the short-term future is quite alarming because you know I think I think there will be pushback and uh, and, and conflict. I think we've we've seen in in Britain in England, uh, you know, the determination of the banks, uh, advertising industry, other. Uh, pillars of the you know corporate economy to impose their very restricted uh, uh, um, vision on people uh, and not to retreat unless they face mm-hmm. uh, a huge outcry so you know this is the making of a real internal strife that could match or even exceed what we've seen in France right uh, under under macron so I mean, of course, your book is um, 
critical of these political leaders in general. But, you know, and you say it's a quite pessimistic view there, but is there is there anything that gives you hope? Well, uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I look at the people who are calling the shots, uh, not just in Europe, but Europe is my beat. Uh, and I think what a, a mediocre bunch of people they are. You know, how they manage to ascend to their gilded positions is uh, un, almost unbelievable. Uh, and I, I can't see those people uh, uh, really prevailing uh, in, in, in the long term. Uh, I think uh, there has to be pushback from vital forces in society, uh, not through uh, violence, but, you know, through... Uh, you know, through the electoral arena, through peaceful protests, through using the courts, uh, to using the media, uh, and and I think it will happen. Uh, and so uh, there will be uh, a great period of turbulence ahead in uh, in Europe. I don't see. I see very few places are likely to remain uh, calm. Uh, unstable, but of course the danger is that uh, preoccupied by working out its, its own destiny, Europe will be very vulnerable to uh, aggression from uh, powerfully undemocratic forces in the world. Yeah. So it, it is a perilous time we are entering. Well, we have seen some examples of that, of course, in more recent history, and there is a chapter on uh, Zelensky and some mentions of Putin in the book. So I'd like to thank you for coming on the show today. Tom's book, Europe's Leadership Famine, Portraits of Defiance and Decay, 1950 to 2022, is available now on Amazon as paperback here and also available as a Kindle that you can down, download. I really recommend this. It's a great um not it's, just, it's an introduction to those leaders if you haven't really thought about them before, but also it's got a great analysis on how they compare and how they combine together to put Europe in the situation it's in. And of course, lots of questions, some of the questions we've talked about today come out of that. What's next? Uh, how can things be better? Um, how can we avoid? this uh, type of thing in the future. So a big recommendation. A huge thank you to you, Tom, for coming to talk to me today. Thanks for having me on, Mark. I really enjoyed it. That was great. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon. Okay.